Happy Friday, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of experience as a uh, painter, a business owner, to answer any of your questions. Uh, I'm going to pull up my guest here real quick. Finish the introduction here in a second. Hey, Dustin, how's it going? Good. How are you? All right, I got uh, three minutes of introduction here, and then we'll get to it, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, homeowners, uh, this is the show where you can ask anything you've ever wanted to ask a professional painter. Uh, no judgment here on this show. I'm going to plug in this so I can hear Dustin better. Um, for uh, professionals, uh, this is a place where we can share our ideas and uh, do something to further our craft. We can talk marketing, entrepreneurship, uh, coding science, uh, production, uh, salesmanship, things like that. So uh, today uh, I have Dustin Zapanzik here, and you are the owner of uh, Dreamscape Painting. Uh, and we're going to be talking, uh, one of your specialties, one of the things that you can bring uh, to the table that many other people can't is uh, your experience with high-end new construction residential projects. So why don't you tell us how you got into the painting trade, and we'll go from there. Sure, yeah, for sure. Can you guys, you can hear me all right? I can hear you, yep. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, my start in the painting industry, my dad actually started the uh, business just over 25 years ago. And uh, so I was involved at a very young age, pretty much child labor, cleaning rollers and brushes and occasional site visits where I, you know, help, helped out. <laughs> and um, then it took a long time for me to decide that that was the track that I actually wanted to pursue. Um, um, but basically, ever since after high school, I worked for my dad full time, and uh, now he is going to be retiring in a couple of years. So I've kind of taken over the, I bought into the business and taken over all the back end, and my dad's still on site supervising uh, job sites. Um, but then I, I take care of all the sales, marketing, and run sites and everything else. So, okay, so give us a uh, give us a glimpse of what uh, what you and your company look like on a day to day. Yeah, so there is uh, myself and my dad. We have one office admin, and then we have nine other full time painters. Um, a typical day for me is I is I probably am on site about twenty five to thirty percent of the time, depending on the you know job site needs. Um, I try to go to do a lot more technical support, some of the tricky spraying or help some of my site supervisors plan out different, you know, whatever it is they're taking on. Um, and then the rest of my day is usually spent coordinating the different crews and, uh, and lining up jobs and materials, supplies, et cetera, for the you know, days and weeks ahead. Yeah. Okay. And how much, uh, I, I know you do some very, very interesting high-end new construction. How much of your business comprises of that versus uh, possible residential repaint or commercial and industrial? Yeah. So we do pretty much all residential. And of that, um, probably about 50 to 70% of our revenue comes from the really big high-end homes. Um, and when I say that, a really big high-end home, uh, we're just finishing up one project now for reference that um, we started last October. So I've got, I just checked this morning, I got 10,507 hours into that so far. And um, that's the 17,000 square foot house. And uh, so yeah, it's just like really labor intensive. It's all, all MDF, we've got panel walls, all carbon kind of grade finishes. So just a lot, a lot of prep. Um, so okay. jobs like that, although we may only have one or two going on at any given time, they're probably about 50 to 70% of our business or our revenue. And then the rest would be uh, mid-sized um, new construction residential and maybe 10% like repaints and 10% mm -hmm. extra. Okay. Okay, and, and how did you initially get into some of these higher end projects? Yeah, so a lot of it is uh, just word of mouth, and uh, my dad started the company a long time ago, so uh, he started doing mostly repaints and really low-end spec homes, you know, where you just blast off two homes in three days from start to finish, you know, 
Um, so he kind of started at the bottom and uh, just m moved his way up as far as learning and experience and, um, and reputation. So for us, a lot of, a lot of these big homes come through contractors we've known for years or like I've worked with the same finishing carpenters on jobs for the last 10, 10 or so years. So we give, you know, we give each other work. So a lot of our work is, is reference based, you know, so I don't have okay, to do Okay. And it. how, <laughs> and, and based on some of those jobs, cause that's, you know, when you talk about possible a job that could take, you know, 10,000 hours, that's basically five guys for an entire year something like that. That's, that's a little bit of, of an outlierish kind of project. Not many people have projects that last a year or two. Do you think you have to structure your business differently or you do anything different than a, you know, somebody who does 90% residential repaint because of the type of work you do? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, there certainly is challenges doing projects like that because they're, they're great to have in a steady work for a year or sometimes two, but then they're over. And if you haven't, kept the ball rolling on everything else, like, you know, it's, uh, you could be out of work, you know? So yeah. the <laughs> beneficial, like for, for me, it's really beneficial to have, um, that may keep five people busy, but I have the other five people working on other smaller jobs to keep the ball rolling and try to keep the gaps filled in. Um, because like there may be times on those big sites where there's work for 10 people for, a month and then you know we have to back off we've finished an area the finishers are working in a different area or we can't get into somewhere because the towel guys are going to be in there for a couple weeks so then we're down to like one or two guys for a month so it can vary up and down so the, there definitely is challenges with that and if it if it was just you know me with one or two other people um it would be a lot harder to maintain a, any sort of flow in the business you know and, and when you, um, obviously you're good at keeping relationships with these general contractors good. What do they want from you? Yeah, so, you know, dealing with the contractors, or sometimes some of these homes are through the homeowners even, it's, um, it's basically they want whatever they want and they get whatever they want. <laughs> you know? um, and so part of, part of doing those contracts means that I get to be really flexible and um, mm. that's, that's a really big, that's a big important thing for them is, is flexibility and also being able to come up with solutions, not problems. And that's something we really try to emphasize is, um, you know, there's a lot that I don't know. Um, but when we come across something or an unusual situation, is I really draw on the people that I do know. Um, there, like I have some good relationships with, um, with some local spray shops, um, other cabinet finishers, and other painters where I can, you know, draw upon their experience to learn and uh, bring solutions to the table. Um, so that's, that's a big thing. And they also, I think a lot of the contractors, they want it to run smoothly. So they're, they're looking for uh, painting contractors that are are watching their back as well. So I would say, you know, there's a lot of times where uh, my employees are helping out the finishing carpenters to work up, work with them to like, what's gonna be best for, what can they do now that will help us in the end? And what can we do now that will help them, their product look better? So it becomes really collaborative. Um, and the only way I can really do that is doing some of these projects on like a time and material basement. Uh, basement, time material basis. And uh, that gives me the freedom to just say yes to whatever they want and to come up with solutions. I think that's what's really important. Wonderful. Uh, and um, obviously, you know, along with these big projects comes um, some very high end finishes. Um, what have you found an effective way to get your guys good and, and able to go in a 13,000 square foot house and produce? Well, I mean, I don't remember who it was that said, you know, you got to spend, if you spend 10,000 hours at something, you become an expert, right? So after a couple of these homes, um, some of my guys have spent, you know, a lot of hours. I was looking at, at my guy's hours. One of my guys at this one house we've been working at, he's been there for personally almost 1,400 hours. Um, 
So, you know, you get, you become kind of an expert in, in the house. So, and what I think a lot of people um, who come into painting or want to do nice stuff, they figure like, they just want to paint for a couple of years and get past uh, doing all the prep work, you know, the, they come in, they expect to do prep, but then they expect to get good enough that they don't have to do prep. And then they get to just paint after it, right? Paint walls. Um, whereas most, you know, a lot of the prep in these homes is so critical that I can't have my new guys doing all the prep, you know? Um, so as far as training, there's a lot of on the job training where you come and they're on a house that's that big, there's enough areas where we can work beside our new hires and our, our new trainees and bring them up to the school and just you know. Okay, and no, yeah, absolutely. And um, new construction often gets a bad rap. It's uh, when you say that, you know, hey, I do a lot of new construction and it's actually fun and it's good and it's uh, the margins are higher, things like that. People, people raise an eyebrow because it's not definitely the, the industry norm. How do you think you turn um, a, a segment of our industry that has a horrible name into actually something fun and productive and satisfying? Yeah, well, again, I have the real huge blessing of um, coming into a business that's been established for quite a while. And um, a lot of the stuff that we do, there's not a lot of painters in our area that can provide those finishes on site. Um, so for us, often people are hiring us because of what we can do, not because we're necessarily the cheapest. And um, I definitely agree that a lot of the newer, new construction spec homes, some of the mid to lower end is a lot more competitive to what, you know, for what some painters are willing to charge and, and what they're willing to give. So for me, I prefer to try not to compete with, with that market because frankly, they're, I'm not, that's not my strength. A lot of the other guys are, are a lot faster and better at that, you know. It's, it can be really tough for my employees to adjust from spending eight hours sanding a door frame to having to sand and caulk and fill all the, you know, the whole house in eight hours. It's, it's a difficult adjustment. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. So I think it's just, it's an, an entirely different market of new construction, I think. And um, there's more of the people who are in that market have money to spend. And, uh, you yeah, it's kind of my niche of them. Have you, uh, I mean, obviously we're, we've been around just long enough to, to remember the, uh, the great recession 10 years ago. Is, is this something in your market that, that is sort of in the back of your mind floating around somewhere? Or do you feel that, uh, in many ways you may have, uh, created something that might be, um, not, uh, not affected by something like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't, we haven't been too affected by, by the recession um, because a lot of these people who are building, you know, 10, 20 plus million dollar homes that, you know, they still have money at the end, of, you know, at the end of the day um, and they're still going to build their home. You know, we did one house that they were building the house for about seven years. Um, so, <laughs> The painting portion of that, we were there for about 9,500 hours, and uh, wow. that was spread out, over, spread out over almost two years. So that's a, you know, that's a long portion of time. Like, they're not going to stop building their house because one year or two years is, is bad, you know? So, yep, exactly. So that higher-end market, I don't think they're quite as effective. Okay. And uh, for, a, for a contractor who, who has the manpower to complete something like that and has a relatively good handle on fine finishing, um, and you don't do houses that are, you know, probably two to three million dollars plus, how does somebody like that as a paint business owner make the first steps to get into that market? Yeah, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great question. Um, and again, I've been like super blessed. I can't say it enough. Coming into a, an established business where a lot of those relationships have been formed over years, um, because it is challenging. 
a good friend of mine has a painting company, uh, Kristen Painters Mark, locally, and he's really trying to break into that. He's only been established for a couple of years, and it's really challenging to build up the relationships and the trust because it is a lot of trust when you tell someone, you know, hey, sure, we can paint your house. It's going to cost several hundred thousand, and it's going to take over a year. That's not really an attractive proposition for a lot of <laughs> homeowners. Um, yeah. So we can, it definitely takes a while to build, to build the trust, but I think, you know, putting the time into putting yourself out there to make connections, finding out who are the builders in your area who are doing like the luxury home buildings. Um, also putting time in to develop your skills and, and craft to be able to provide those solutions that you know that you may one day be having to do so that when you get into those situations, you can provide solutions, not problems, you know? And that's even just as simple as uh, developing relationships with people like who are non-competitive, which is still exactly like, you know, me and me and you and uh, other members of the PDCA are great resources to chat about these situations. Um, yeah. Well, um, uh, another question I was going to ask you for some perspective is it seems like houses up to about a million, um, the paint budget seem to float somewhere between three and 5% of total budget, which is a pretty amazing number when you think of, you know, 90% of everything you see in this house is going to comprise three to 5% of the budget. Once you start breaking into those, uh, you know, a 10 to $20 million home, do you find that that's still about the same, the equivalent three to 5% or does that grow or shrink depending on, you know? Yeah, you know, to be honest, um, most of the contractors and homeowners don't share with me the total value of their, of, of the, of the house. So I can't really give a super accurate answer on there, you know, give some half decent guesstimates, I guess. <laughs> but I would think the percentage would rise higher because it, the amount of time spent to provide those finishes goes up exponentially, you know, to, yeah. to provide a, a level six out of 10 finish versus a level eight versus a level nine. It just starts really climbing up there. So I would guess that it's probably a higher percentage than a regular. Okay. And uh, normally uh, the PDCA, uh, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, partners with me to sort of bring a contractor question of the week. And uh, in lieu of that this week, I'm debuting a new segment called Asking for a Friend. And it's sort of like a lightning round sort of thing. I'm just going to rifle through some commonly asked questions, uh, questions that I probably get about 20 or 30 times a week. And we're just going to, uh, because we have the benefit of you on, I'm just going to rifle through them quick. You don't have to answer anything. You don't have to. Nothing's too specific, but just give me a quick top of the head answer if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite website for finding employees or apprentices? Oh, I hate to say it. Craigslist. It's been my most successful. I get, it's been my most successful, but I also get the worst applications ever. So, it seems I've like both. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I've, tried, I've tried Indeed and, and I've had a lot of people I know have had a lot of success, but I have not yet. Okay. Um, estimating software. Do you, do you have a, do you use some, do you have a favorite? I don't, I, I just spreadsheet it. I got a spreadsheet that yep. works for me and worked on. So, and uh, to be honest, I don't quote that often. You know, a lot of my, it's the big project lasts a long time and some of them you don't even quote. And then a lot of other new construction projects last four to six weeks often. So I don't really care that often. Okay. Uh, best thing business wise that happened to you this last year? Um, I think probably ramping up my involvement with um, the PDCA. I've really learned a lot and gotten a lot out of my uh, relationship. A lot of the people that I've met through it, I've really grown a lot that way. It's probably been one of the biggest impact, things that impacted me, just to motivate me to, you know, explore different areas, open my mind to different ways of doing things. And yeah, I think that's been really encouraging. Okay. Um, new drywall. Uh, favorite primer? Favorite top coat? 
oh, people are, are not going to like this. Um, <laughs> I am not very particular about, about my drywall primer. Um, I haven't really found significant performance differences. Um, so usually it's uh, between my local stores, this who's going to give me a really great price on my drywall. Mm. Um, yep. Yep. And then as far as top coats, uh, depending on, I usually, I usually either use, um, all the higher end stuff, we always use Benjamin Moore's era. And we yep. get a back and spa mat, mat finish. And, uh, probably mid-level. I don't know. What it's It's kind of a team case. I haven't really decided on what I like. Right now, we're using a little bit of stone and super paint. Super long, super long, super long, super super long in, in our area, so it's kind of a few things. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, do you have a, uh, a stain and clear coat system for interior woodwork that you like? You know, it really depends on the situation. Um, I really love using uh, spray and wipe stains. I, I use a nice one from um, Innovative Manufacturing. And spray and wipe, nice, it's got some good looking time after you spray it. And if you're doing like a whole wall of paneling, you know, it's not going to dry too fast. You need to use really, really some more on there. It's really, really nice. Easy to repair. And then I really like using um, some of the Chroma Pros. Uh, post catalyzed peelers, um, like the hair seal, and then follow by the bar, the top coat is really nice. But then other times, um, for like exteriors, I'll use some of the Sandstone products, like the Waterborne. They're kind of like a hybrid uh, clear coat. Um, they have their Sandstone ENS is a nice clear coat I've had great success with. And sometimes I like to use Old Master's oil stain on exteriors, followed by the ENS top coat, or I'll use the Sanson uh, waterborne stain. Just the waterborne stains are tricky. They just dry so fast because it's hard to work with them. Yeah. Large areas and you know, other corners and not really to be the same. Okay. Uh, again, asking for a friend. Uh, most unique project of the year for you? Um, we just finished up one house. I'm really excited about uh, because we got the photographer's been through and we're going to get pictures up soon. So hopefully if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see some more of those. We had a really cool one um, with a lot of plaster molding and trim. And a lot of it was uh, hand painted with gold metallic paint. Um, that was really fun to do. Um, but super, super time intensive because we had to prime the bare plaster, then paint it all the background color and then hand paint a different background color and then highlight all the um, floral accents um, with the gold metallic paint. And that was really fun, uh, super time intensive, but just really cool. We don't, there's not a lot of that kind of architecture up in this area, so fun to do that. Sure. That's awesome. Um, one major goal for 2018? Um, probably to, uh, I'm really working hard on um, getting all of my standard operating procedures really nailed down so that my site supervisors can are like super confident to just go into the job, they know what's expected of them, they know the scope, they know the level of finish, and they can produce it from you know start to finish with a with their um, gross profit goal all in place. So my goal this year is to just really nail that down. And have everyone like super confident and excited to uh, meet their goals and produce things. Okay. Um, if you had uh, two choices to hire, one person had 11 years, they claim 11 years as a painter. The other one has never painted before without any other information. Who would you take? Um, the person who, probably the person who hasn't painted before. Um, all of our best hires so far have been people we've trained from the ground up without bad habits or, you know, they don't know better than us or they're not above doing prep work. So mm. um, sometimes, I would say 70% of the time, the people with no experience end up being a better hire. 
Okay. Uh, if you weren't a paint business owner, what do you think you'd be doing? So, I don't know. That's a good question. Something in the service. Something in the service industry. I like providing something that helps people, that changes their space, that um, makes people's life better. Um, but it would definitely have to employ people because I love being able to provide opportunities for for people and for my employees. And um, I hope that I'm building something that they can be proud of. Okay. Um, Facebook or Instagram and why? Um, I, I like Instagram better. I think I don't know, it's just more focused on pictures. So it's, it's quicker. It's easier for me. Um, I'm not as great at social media interactions, so there seems to be less required with Instagram. And I've just had more success with it in the past. Okay. Um, if you had to hire somebody, you already have an admin. Uh, if you had to hire one other person for your business that was not a painter, but also worked for your business, you know, we're talking salesman, uh, production uh, coordinator, something like that, who would you add to your team right now? Uh, production manager. Yeah, and sure. and what would their day to day look like? Um, a lot of what my day looks like. So <laughs> Skype visits and um, technical support and scheduling um, give me a little more freedom to focus on more sales, marketing, and uh, business development. Okay, and uh, last one here. Uh, this is uh, again the the brand new segment, asking for a friend, uh, brought to you by the PDCA. Uh, last one. What do you better? What do you do better than anybody else in our industry? Um, probably nothing. You know, <laughs> better than anybody else. But I, I think one thing I think we're really good at is um, changing our level of finish depending on our clients' needs. You know, we don't. We can provide a super high end finish and be there for a year, but if on the next project we have different needs, we can. Tone it down. <coughs> okay, no, that sounds great. Um, do you want to hang out and see if there's any questions here from anybody? Yeah, Maybe we can sure. buzz through them together. Okay, sure. Jesse Krennic, thank you for watching. Richard Heilman, as usual, he's another local painter. Dean Cudd, appreciate you watching as well. Nick May, uh, Nick May's a painting contractor out in Colorado. I just did his podcast, uh, the Business Brush Podcast. That was a good one. Jody Pika Hunt, client of mine. Uh, Mr. Palmiera, thank you for watching. Ron and Darius. Jose Rodriguez, Amoeda, thank you for watching. Ken McElmore. And you guys, if you have any other questions here, you can leave them. I saw that somebody had a question about stain. You can go ahead. We don't have to talk uh, specifically high end new construction. This is sort of just an open forum here. Gustavo, uh, as usual. Russ Perry, thank you for watching. Um, do, 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 do. I don't have translation. Uh, once this thing's posted, it'll translate. So. My apologies to all my Portuguese-speaking uh, followers here. Tammy Pint, uh, Fernando Granado, thank you for watching. Alexander, uh, Jim Johnson, Ron Endress, this is awesome. Thank you. Shirley Nestor, Jody Coleman, uh, Paul Rafferty, decorators, thank you for watching. Dan Stepka, Jim Callahan, he was a past guest. Austin McCracken, thank you for watching. Kelly Chadwick, friend of mine. Uh, Stevie Jonitas, um, Jody Coleman. I've been on one project for almost a year, 10,000 square feet, remodel and additional finishing of basement, interior and exterior. And Jody, if you got any pictures of that, I'd love to see some of that. That'd be fun. Um, mm -hmm. and, if anybody, uh, and if anybody does not follow Dreamscape Painting, uh, do yourself a favor, head over to Instagram and you'll see some of the nicest houses in North America that Dustin's got his uh, fingers in. So um, Julian Pemberton, thank you for watching. Tim Marcellet, past apprentice of mine. Russ Perry, I have a staining question uh, for you, Nick, but can I leave it for another time if it isn't relevant? No, go right ahead. You go right ahead. Stephen Capetto, Tony Verhoeven, thank you for watching. Andrea Kellenhofer, client of mine, thank you. Jeremy Sexy, uh, Trevor Strom Stromquist from 3M, thank you for watching. Uh, Zachy Frey, design. Derek Anslem, as usual. Rafael D'Souza, I, I like following uh, Rafael on uh, on Facebook. He's got some good, uh, good projects up there. So Kurt, thank you. Sarah Bizek, uh, Christine O'Connell from the PDCA. Thank you for watching as well. 
Ah, oh, this is a great one. Russ Perry, thoughts on trade vocational schools for hiring new talents. I'll do 30 seconds, and then you're the man to answer this. Uh, you actually have insight. Uh, I wish there were more. I can't find any. And if there were any near me, I would definitely be involved in them. Now, you actually have those in Canada, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, so I live near Vancouver in British Columbia. And uh, we have, you can get your ticket, your, paint, your Red Seals journeyman ticket in uh, painting and decorating. So, which I, I did a few years ago. And one of my other employees, he's got his ticket. And then I have three registered apprentices who are going through that program currently. Um, I think it's really great. What does that I mean, program look here, like, Dustin? Yeah, so um, there's a requirement for, there's three levels. And your level one, you can start with having no experience. And it's six weeks of, of coursework. And um, you can collect uh, your government uh, employment insurance during that time as well, which is great. Um, and there's um, the six weeks of training. We can cover things like paint technology, learning, you know, what makes up paint, why paint is what it is and how it works. Um, and then learning about spray equipment, all that sort of thing. And then you write a test. There's a little bit of practical work. And then you're done your one level. And then the second and third levels, there's hour requirements where they have to work, you know, so many, several thousand hours before they can take the next level. So it's typically a three to four year process. Uh, to collect your hours and go through the program um, before you can write your final exam and then you're certified. Now, out here, it's really geared towards a lot more of the union painters, a lot of the more industrial painters, because there's mandatory like uh, pay raises at different uh, levels of. You know, you know, you know. Okay. Um, so there's not very many residential painters that, that have it out here, but uh, I think it's awesome because it exposes um, all everybody to like all these different facets of painting that they might not ever get to do. You know, like I've never sandblasted on a job, but because of doing at school, I've learned about it and got to do it. And if I had a project that came up, you know, I have the confidence to at least you know, get started into it or, in, or, you know, um, so I think it's, I think it's really great. And I wish, I wish there was more of it for sure. Wonderful. And if, if you were gonna, um, obviously, I think you've mentioned before that you possibly, you know, send some of your guys there. Do you, do you help them out with the cost of that? Yeah. So basically there's like a, the course out here costs like $800 to take. So we tell them if they pass, then we'll cover the cost. Um, and you know, if you're just, if you're paying attention, you know, <laughs> so. awesome. It, it is uh, yeah. That. Yeah. I wish, I, I wish we had a little more of that here. Uh, two or three years ago, I was actually looking for a wallpaper school. Cause I, I heard tell that there were three sort of academies you could go to and they were all sort of like antebellum mansions down South. There's a coordinator of it. He gets six people together and you basically go through, there is nothing you won't know about high end uh, wallpaper uh, hanging after that. And it uh, turns out they all just disappeared. Uh, I'm sure there's some out there, but you can't readily find them. And uh, it's, it's very tough. So it's, it's sort of sad. Um, there's a sort of critical mass building, at least in the upper Midwest here where people are, are trying to get uh, some more people into the trades, but uh, it's slow uh, with our trade schools to develop a, a program like this and, and fully staff it. It's a tough thing. So kudos to you guys up there. That's a really exciting thing. Yeah, it's great. We try to take advantage of any other training opportunities that some of our local stain and lacquer suppliers put on, right? And we do our best to try to send guys and take them myself. Nice. Uh, Natalie Newbert, thank you so much. Uh, Natalie's dad, John, is actually going to be a guest on an upcoming show here. Sam Onan, a classmate of mine, uh, Jeff Morrow. Uh, I've actually, with the advent of this dual live, I'm having such a blast with this stuff, and I'm getting such good feedback that uh, I've actually booked up the next five weeks with guests, and we got some of the heavy hitters just like you, Dustin. It's going to be really awesome. So 
Um, Steve Fast, a uh, little known fact, Dustin did the original paint job on the Statue of Liberty. You guys are amazing. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve is, is a local guy here. He um, owns a spray shop, and we collaborate on projects often if there's – I'll do stuff for him in the field, and, and he'll do stuff for me in, uh, in the shop. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. Betty Schmitz, Rob Lenzen, another local contractor here. Uh, Chris Patterson, a, a paint rep from up here. Uh, Mike Danahy, yes, there are multiple Sanders and uh, construction guys working here. Jenny Stika, Sandro Santos, uh, Eduardo Mello, thank you for watching. Uh, Christopher Riggins, he's another uh, contractor from down south. Uh, Chris Stafford as well. Uh, PDCA, this has been awesome, guys. Thanks, Nixon and Dustin. Uh, some great braining happening here. That's a, uh, that's a new verb I have not heard before, but uh, I'm willing to take it on. So uh, Joe Hecker, uh, he is a, a design guy. Joe actually designs uh, lighting fixtures for like hotel casinos in Vegas and stuff. And I was just on his show this last week. So uh, Christopher Riggins, do you use a pre-stained conditioner? Uh, I do not because it affects the color. Uh, Dustin, your thoughts? Uh, I typically do. Um, I don't know. I think sometimes it's helpful with um, some oil stains, but I have found that a thorough sand is as effective and um, more consistent, easier to, like you said, predict what the color is going to be. Yeah, and I've I've found that a lot of times the the blotching thing is more of a. Uh a people management issue than it is a finishing issue because if somebody's going to give me pine and wants to stain it black there's not any amount of pre-stained conditioner you can put on that will also allow the wood to be black and non-blotchy and all that stuff so i usually just advise them you know you're definitely going to blotch or if you get uh quarter sawn uh, white oak, it's not going to blotch it's going to look awesome so it's sort of a uh, you, you lay out the possibilities for them so uh, Joe Hecker sharing is caring. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe is awesome. It was fun to be on his show. Cesar Ramirez, thank you very much. Stephen Smith. Uh, Russ, he's in Saskatchewan. Great fishing up there. Uh, Dwayne Battles is watching as well. Mike Danahy, uh, does a Red Seal certification have any benefit on residential repaints? Um, no, it doesn't. Um, just... <laughs> Really, it's just credibility, and for my own, um, for my own learning, you know, and for my uh, my guys' own learning is why I want them to to go through it. You know, there's wonderful, some, Patty. Oh, knowledge is power for sure. <laughs> um, Patty Doolin, classmate of mine. Uh, Bob Duffy, a flooring guy here from Minnesota. Uh, Caleb Benson. Uh, let's see, Chris Patterson, check out St. Paul College. Well, I'm gonna have to do that now. I'm 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 peaked. Uh, Nick LeClaire, I came in late, so not sure if it's been answered. Do you have a favorite wood filler for trim? We actually spoke about this at the last residential forum, and if you can see behind, well, this this frame doesn't have it, but this frame here has a little bit of wood filler on it. Um, my favorite is actually a water-based product from Ace Hardware. Uh, Dries really fast, goes on easy, sands really easy, but it's rock hard and uh, doesn't flash, doesn't uh, shrink, uh, things like that. So I found a good use with that, uh, something not far. Dustin, uh, you do tons and tons of interior fine finishing. Uh, do you have a favorite? When you say wood filler, you mean for filling wood that's going to be stained or like more? Probably just nail stained. holes and things like that yeah. for painted um, woodwork. Yeah, paint grade. I usually use a dry decks for a first fill. And um, then you sand that reprime trim and then use uh, the glazing putty, like the Dynatron glazing putty for a, for a final fill. Okay. Uh, Nick Braith is watching, another local fella here. Uh, Cesar Ramirez, thank you for watching. Uh, Tony Dehart, watching from Southern California. It's probably a heck of a lot nicer there than it is here. Uh, Christopher Riggand, uh, what grit do you pre-sand with before staining? You want to take this one, Dustin? Sure. Um, it, it, you know, it, I think probably generally 150, but it really depends on what you're doing with the wood, right? You sand it coarser, you can make it a bit darker, sand it finer. 
but not too fine. You can make it a bit lighter. So it's, you know, it's all about, you yeah, it's, a, it's, 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 it's very tricky. Uh, especially if you, uh, if you have approved stain samples, you know, you can, you can take a little square of wood and polish it to high heaven and, and make it not blotch and do other things, but then you're going to really affect the color too. So the best case scenario is you get wood that's, from the manufacturer that's relatively defect free and is about like you said maybe a 150 give or take and uh, sometimes we'll just take either uh 150 or a roughed up medium sanding sponges just to scuff it just to make sure there's no mill glaze and things but uh yeah you you want it porous enough where uh stain will actually penetrate and be even but um yeah it's always tough it, it would be great if we could just high polish 220, you know, uh, 300, something like that. So the finish is better, but then you affect the color. Uh, Kevin Cisco, thank you for watching. Nick LeClaire, no problem. Happy to help. Uh, Bucky Allen, watching from Tennessee. Uh, Russ Perry, I have a 2014 property to view next week where the front door has been stained with interior stain originally. The customer wants it restaining with the correct product, but wants it done without removing the door. Um, I assume we're talking about the exterior of a wood door. Um, if you're going to strip that down, that's going to be very tough to do on the hinges while they're living in the house. Uh, the process I normally do on a front door restoration is uh, I clamp canvas and plastic over the front door, lay it on saw horses, strip it, and immediately mount it again, put on the hardware, let it dry overnight. And then each day you pop it off the saw horses, do some finishing process, uh, and then... Uh, pop it back on. Um, that's about the only way. Usually when homeowners ask for that, they want a secure house. Um, obviously, you can get a carpenter in to install a door blank or some plywood and stuff, but most people don't want to go through the eff extra effort. Uh, Dustin, would you, uh, would you do something like that? Um, yeah, it depends on what was on, what was on the door. I just did um, a couple doors in place, uh, but I used an exterior post cap polyurethane and because um, I knew what was on the door, so I wasn't concerned about adhesion or the coatings interacting funny. Um, so I was able to to do it in place, but I didn't strip it, right? Stripping it, I don't yep. see how you could really strip it um, in place. That would be, well, that yeah, that would be a you, you got to pick a lesser of two evils there. And again, it's a, it's a people management thing first. You have to tell them like, yes, I know that you don't want to spend a lot of money and you want a fully stripped and refurnished door and you don't want to have the door off the hinges, but you're going to have to only pick a few of those things uh, if you really, really want uh, something like that. So I usually just lay out the two options for them. And, uh, if, uh, and, and if the concern is that an interior wood stain was used on it, uh, I normally use interior wood stains. Um, there's really not a lot of difference between, you know, it, there's, there right now, uh, if I went to all my supply stores and Dustin froze up here a bit, oh, there he is. Um, if I went to my supply stores and asked for an exterior wood stain that I'm going to varnish over, that really doesn't exist. Uh, the exterior stains you get are a sort of, uh, you know, linseed oil based something or other, and they're not conducive to a fine finish. So I, I use interior stains outside and all of them are basically pigmented stains um, and you're not going to get a fading issue um, relatively uh, relative to like dye stains, dye stains will get blasted in a, in a matter of no time. So um, yeah, Justin, like the project you, uh, you mentioned, that's an, you know, if, if the finish is relatively good, just needs to be scuffed and cleaned up. You can even turn that door inside of the house, build yourself a spray booth right inside the house and just go to town on it. I've done that before. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Kelly, uh, when you submit an estimate on high end uh, and they see the price, do they ever say why so much? And if so, what do you tell them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> for some of the really big projects, sometimes the process of getting the job could be a year or more, you know, where they, they know they're building this house and it takes a long time to get it paint ready. So it can be, you know, a conversation once a month or something where you kind of bring it along further and further. So it's, it's all about education and educating them on while well, finding out what their needs are first and then educating 
them on what it's going to take to get there. And one of the things we, um, for those clients that are uh, time and material clients, we really stress transparency. So when we mm-hmm. are invoicing them, we invoice them every two weeks. So we never let it get too far. And we submit a detailed breakdown of every one of our employees' hours and what they spent them on, um, as well as all of our receipts, um, so that they can see exactly what they're being billed for. And if they have any questions, because you know they might walk in one day and go, "Oh, this look, nothing looks different. You guys are still sanding in here," you know. Um, but to be able to show them where all the hours were spent, um, that's what we, what we really stress. And. I usually on those projects, the first month or two is it's all about building trust. And once they see us working and they see how it is being tracked and the transparency is there, then they're a lot more comfortable and uh, it usually moves along quite smoothly for the most part. So magically, it's it's that whole trust thing again, huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Josh Erickson, thank you for watching. Uh, Chris Patterson, the hardwood flooring industry has good info on sanding techniques such as never jump more than two grits between. Uh, Megan Kennedy, thank you for watching. Darren Davies, uh, Russ Perry, uh, thanks guys, you are welcome. Ryan Anderson, um, you guys are known as the best painting company. Oop, that one just skipped a, the, in the lower mainland. You still find customers unhappy with the finish, and how do you deal with them? Yeah. Oh, right. boy. That's great. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest challenge for us on some of these, on these projects is I'm trying to balance providing the best possible finish in a responsible manner because I could easily tell my guys, sure, like just spend all the time in the world and make it, you know, pristine and, you know, the hours just go up exponentially. Um, but you really have to try to manage, you know, the cost is up exponentially. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a delicate balancing act. Um, and again, it's part of education is sometimes at parts of the different critical areas of the project, I'll meet with them and just say, hey, listen, this is what it looks like at this point. Are you happy with this? Or would you like to take it further? Because we can definitely take it further, we can do more, but this is, you know, it's going to take roughly 25% more time or, or that sort of thing, you know? So I find that um, involving them in the decision process makes them much more happy with the end result. Um, so, yeah, that's always keeping them educated and um, abreast of the situation is always going to be the best thing, you know? Sometimes I think I'm doing people a favor by moving things along a little quicker because even I'm like, oh, it's taking a really long time, guys. But then that's not actually what they <laughs> That's true. And, you know, the uh, again, back to the people management issue, uh, the only times when you run into big problems like that is, is when there's dissonance between what was expected to happen and what you actually did. And usually, you know, you throw in a little bit of human error explaining everything and showing samples at, at the first uh, outset just sets that. And, and uh, a lot of the times it's not the actual finish. It's, it's the expectation of something that you maybe promised or did not promise. It actually happened. So um, yeah, being uh, like you said, having enough experience to tell people, yes, it takes me 50 hours to prep a kitchen before we even prime it. And here's an actual oak cabinet door that looks like after I prime and paint it. And when they look at their kitchen, it looks exactly like your cabinet door and they saw 50 hours of prep. That makes people uh, sit at ease a little better. So, Uh, Louis Littlechild, thank you for watching. David Kelly, uh, Altamir, thank you for watching. Nick LeClaire, uh, my biggest issue with custom new homes is protecting the door casings and wainscoting after the initial spray finish so we're not uh, reworking all the trim. Uh, Yeah, you know what's funny? Uh, I could take you downstairs uh, in this place. We stain and varnish all the trim. My guys actually take a cardboard and low-tack tape, and we basically uh, 
we basically just save all the door frames, especially on the lower 18 inches. That's where all the guys are running their cords or they'll be, you know, pulling a sawhorse through things like that. And uh, especially on new construction, I'm sure you found that too, Dustin. It's that you, as soon as you get a finished place, especially horizontal surfaces, uh, immediately 12 Mountain Dew cups end up on them, you know. Absolutely. And you can imagine, you know, working on a job site for a year, there's a lot of areas that are already finished with people walking through. So we repair a lot of trade damage. Um, but you can also get us through hardware stores. You can get like really nice cardboard corners and they're like really stiff 90 degree corners that you can like put on your insides of your casings, tape them on there, which really helps a lot, especially from core dragging. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's, there's actually, I know of at least one company who makes them. So they're almost spring loaded. They're, they're like a big C like this and you bait, they, they're built in enough spring where you can just clamp them on the outside of casing. So good. I mean, anything you can do, you're, you're never going to get away without any touch-ups, but uh, you just got to out, out think all the rest of the trades, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, Dustin, I think we've, we've got to the end of the questions here. Thank you so much. This was awesome. And if you don't mind, uh, we're definitely going to do this again. Uh, I, I had a blast. I met you first time at the residential forum for the PDCA. And uh, again, you, you sort of, uh, I've been on this year long quest for perspective since I've sort of, you know, uh, grown on an Island out here. And uh, you were one of the guys uh, that I looked to this last year when I'm sort of reforming my business. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was great. Lots of fun. Yeah. So we're going to do it again. So everybody have a good weekend. Thanks to Dustin. Follow Dreamscape Painting. If you have not seen uh, what one of these two-year-long projects looks like, uh, uh, take a look at his stuff, and it'll make you want to wake up earlier and uh, work on your fine finishing for sure. So uh, have a good weekend, Dustin, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.